Hi, uh, my name is Bob Langer. I'm here on behalf of the ABA section of antitrust law to interview Laurel Price, a former chair of the National Association of Attorneys General Multistate Antitrust Task Force. Uh, and I want to thank Laurel for agreeing to be interviewed as part of the section's oral history project. Laurel, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. I uh, just wanted to begin by asking you about your background in terms of where you went to school uh, and the time you spent uh, in the Army before um, uh, you began with uh, the New Jersey uh, Attorney General's office. Well, basically, I went to high school in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, where I spent most of my life. Went to the University of Oklahoma, majored in political science, history, and economics. Uh, graduated in 1967 and enlisted in the Army to avoid being drafted in January 1968. Uh, spent a little time as an instructor at the Army Chemical School, a little time on temporary duty in Alaska, and 13 and a half months in Vietnam. And, and what did you do in Alaska? Uh, actually, we went up there to test toxic nerve agents. And the day after we got there, they had had a testing accident in Dugway, Utah, and they canceled the test. Uh, but then they said we had to stay there for six months because they'd lose the allocation for the next year. Really smart move. Yeah, yeah. so we went hunting and fishing for six months and <laughs> went to see the Army once a month, and they paid me. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that before. Um, and then you went on to law school after you were uh, in the Army? Yeah, uh, I started law school in September of 1970. I think I was 17 days out of Saigon, uh, which had been my last duty station. I was at Long Bin, just north of Saigon, for 13 and a half months. And I assume Vietnam was a good training uh, for going to Columbia Law School? <laughs> well, it gave you a better perspective on how to react to professors, I recall it. Second or third day of school, we had a professor who had sort of the Kingsfield mode of the Socratic method, and the kid next to me kind of elbowed me and said, doesn't he kind of scare you a little? <laughs> I looked at him and said, gee, I don't think he's got a gun. Doesn't look <laughs> like he uses a knife. <laughs> so so it's a different perspective. So when you were at Columbia, there were actually a couple other folks who we, we ended up working with uh, in mm -hmm. state antitrust enforcement who were actually there at the same time. You recall uh, who those? Alan Kovacs and Lloyd Constantine were a year ahead of me. I don't think I knew either one of them at the time, but Alan and I may have had Milton Handler's last antitrust course at Columbia. Wow. So after Columbia, did you immediately go to the New Jersey uh, Division of Criminal Justice? Actually, I had started with the Division of Criminal Justice the summer at the end of my second year. Uh, Elias Abelson, who hired me, was doing the interviewing for the Division of Law that year. And he interviewed me, and we got talking, sharing reminiscences of Milton Handler. And about halfway through the interview, he took my resume, folded it up, stuck it in his inside jacket pocket, and said, you'll be getting a call from me in about six weeks because I've just been given the assignment to create an antitrust section within the Division of Criminal Justice. And so I was his summer law clerk, and at the time it was just he and I. And then? At the end of the summer, he basically offered me a job starting as soon as I got out of law school. And you served in the, in the Department of <clears throat> Justice for how long? I started full-time in August of 73 and retired the end of August 1998. Yeah, you, you and I began, I think, right, I began in September of 73 and, and, and went through 94. So I think at some point you and I were the two most elderly, at least in terms <laughs> of service folks in, in AG's offices doing antitrust work. Uh, we'll come back to this, but you, you then uh, subsequently, after you retired from New Jersey uh, Attorney General's office, you then went uh, to the FTC? Yeah, I uh, left the FTC to take the job of regional director in the Cleveland office of the FTC. I stayed there a little over a year and retired again, at which point my wife accused me of being a serial unsuccessful retirer. Uh, spent a couple of years just 
basically doing a little consulting work mm -hmm. and I remember that. building some furniture and stuff. Uh, and then Pam Harbor called me one day. Actually, it was Lloyd that called me uh, and said Pam was looking for an attorney advisor. And Pam and I chatted. And 2003, I came back to be one of her attorney advisors here in Washington. Yeah, and that's where you are. That's where I am presently. Today. Let's go back and talk about some of the, the key cases that you were involved in uh, when you were with uh, the Department of Justice before we get on to the multi-state uh, task force issues. Uh, there are several dealing with sort of in-house representation, and, and New Jersey was certainly one of the keys uh, to uh, altering the, the private public uh, uh, issue in terms of when lawyers would represent the state in in public purchasing and related antitrust litigation. Can you talk a bit about, uh, you know, fleet discount and, and chickens and fine paper and, and why they're significant? Well, basically, when I started, uh, the state of New Jersey was being represented by uh, a law firm in Chicago, and we had two cases with them at the time, which was the ADT and tetracycline. Mm -hmm. And one of the first assignments I was given was to find a way to break those contracts so that we could represent ourselves. And basically, I did a little legal research, and I went to my boss and said, can I see the contract? And he said, well, it's just an oral understanding between the attorney general and counsel. And I said, well, then as a matter of law, we have no contract because there is a statute that specifically says it has to be a contract signed by the governor and by the attorney general and that no funds can be paid under it without a separate appropriation. Uh, so he then called counsel, had a discussion, and the ultimate upshot was they would continue to represent us in that case but would waive their contingent fee in favor of a court-awarded fee under uh, the Equitable Fund Doctrine. So and you were, your state was really one of the first to break away from the trend that existed in the 60s and early 70s of having private counsel right. represent state attorneys general in propri usually proprietary right. actions. Yeah, and the first case we filed, we filed a class action on behalf of all of New Jersey and all its municipalities in the auto fleet discount case. That's where we got to know each other. Yes. Uh, we had made a mistake when we filed the case, a tactical mistake. The statute in New Jersey, unlike almost any other statute, vested the right for all private, or not private, all public mm -hmm. treble damage actions on behalf of New Jersey or subdivisions of New Jersey in the Attorney General. And a subdivision had no right to sue under state or federal law without the written permission of the attorney general. So in Fleet, after we filed the class, we then tried to amend the pleadings to allege a unitary plaintiff, and Judge McGar denied it on the grounds that it would unduly complicate the consolidated trial of the matter. And miraculously, that case ends up on a petition for certiorari in the U.S. Supreme Court. Which and was described as the most mundane matter on the court's docket that and, year. And I had the privilege of actually writing the amicus brief on, in support of, uh, uh, of New Jersey. Right. Uh, in that. So I, I feel... Uh, you know, a real linkage with uh, with you over that particular matter. Was having such a mundane matter is my first uh, amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, unfortunately, the first time it was successfully asserted was in the master key litigation in Hartford, Connecticut. That's right. right. And we were still represented at that point in Connecticut uh, right. by, by private counsel at that yeah. point. And, but, um, but the important one of those early cases in terms of the movement toward the task force was actually in Ray Chicken antitrust litigation in Atlanta. Now, these were not much of chickens that were price fixing, right? We were talking about. We're talking about a trade association of uh, chicken producers right. to limit the supply of chicken to try to balance it to demand by diverting product into export markets to stabilize the domestic price. 
And it was a classic mistake of law case in the sense that the defendants had gotten legal advice that they were exempt under the Capra-Volstead Capra Act Volstead, as yeah. farmers, and the Supreme Court in the United States injunctive action ruled that it didn't apply. The technical problem in the litigation was this was all happening before Illinois BRIC, and state purchasers and many of the private class claimants were indirect purchasers of chicken. And the defendants wouldn't engage in settlement discussions, even though they knew in a mistake of law question they were going to lose the liability issue until the Supreme Court resolved Illinois BRIC, which was brief but undecided. Plaintiffs then got the idea that they would negotiate a damage allocation agreement among themselves. The problem was that other than Massachusetts and New Jersey, every other state was represented by private counsel that also represented private interests that included direct purchasers. So in order to negotiate the damage allocation agreement among all of the plaintiffs, Steve Greenfogel from Massachusetts and I became de facto state liaison right. counsel for all states in the litigation. And that was really the, <clears throat> the first opportunity to, to really see the beginnings of, of, uh, of public enforcers uh, serving as lead counsel in uh, MDL cases for the states. Right. In know. fact, I had some very funny phone calls in that initial part of that litigation. I'd call people up in a state who thought they were represented by the XYZ law firm and say, I need your decision regarding this matter in this case. And they'd go, well, who the devil are you? <laughs> and I would then explain to them that I was now de facto their lawyer. And ultimately, it worked out. But uh, Just take a minute and, and talk about the complexities that arose out of the fine paper litigation, because that was really, uh, and I was involved <clears throat> in that somewhat, but you were to a much greater extent than I was, and, and how that really was a very divisive uh, matter in some ways. Well, fine paper sort of came up right toward the end of the chicken litigation, and it involved much of the same. You want same. to get the time frame just that maybe we should do this that? This would have been, I'm guessing, 78. Yeah. Th that J Just before the 80s, right? J yeah, just yeah, before yeah, the yeah, 80s. Yeah. And... There had been discussion at various plaintiffs' meetings of this new case that was coming up. And there was a lawyer out of San Francisco who claimed to have a, quote, informant. And he was going to supply us with everything we needed to know about the case. Uh, I subsequently learned that the informant was actually a sealed deposition and made a decision on behalf of New Jersey to have nothing whatsoever to do with the case. Uh, but a number of states who had just received the federal grant monies decided this was going to be their introduction to big-time antitrust. And I would guess upwards of 30 or more states yeah. filed the litigation. And the case resolved itself into three different camps of states. There were the states like New Jersey and New York who were not in the litigation at all and who were represented as part of a national class of governmental purchasers filed by private counsel on behalf of South Dakota. There was a smaller group, the so-called minority states, who were aligned with the private plaintiffs' counsel, and then there was the so-called majority states who were basically taking the case on their own. And the private counsel and the minority states settled the case. The majority states actually ultimately went to trial right. and lost and the lost, trial. Right. But in putting the settlement together, somebody decided that South Dakota should abandon the national class in favor of just a statewide class for settlement purposes. And I convinced John Desiderio, who was then head of the New York antitrust shop to intervene in the Third Circuit, claiming that that was an illegal abandonment of the class, and the Third Circuit agreed. Right. And I ultimately made more or as much money out of the case 
having never filed it, as most of the states that spent a lot of money litigating it. Yeah, it was, and that was another case that was a precipitating cause in the end of private, at least at the time, private and for, uh, private attorneys uh, being uh, commissioned by state attorneys general to bring uh, public purchasing cases. Well, there, were, there are actually two major fallouts, in it, one of which becomes important yeah, later. One involved Connecticut, if you <laughs> uh, Well, th that one actually preceded, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. The two things were there was a huge amount of animosity between various states over how fine paper had developed. And we actually had a conference in early 80s in Stanford, the sole purpose of which was to heal the wounds from fine paper. But the other important was a change was one that occurred on the private plaintiff side. They started routinely excluding state and local government purchasers from their class definitions, right. so states wouldn't have standing to challenge their fees. Exactly, right. <laughs> Why don't we talk a bit about, uh, in addition to your specific antitrust enforcement responsibilities in New Jersey, you also were involved in very significant public corruption cases, um, real sort of comps and robbers type of stuff, and some of it was antitrust and bid rigging and some it wasn't, but uh, you want to talk a bit about the Jersey City case, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, when I was... And when that occurred, about when? Well, 19, summer of 1972, I was working for Mr. Abelson as his law clerk on, in the summer, and the assignment he gave me was a series of hypothetical questions all of which involved various schemes relating to corruption, and said, can you find antitrust theories that will remedy these hypothetical questions? And at the end of the summer, I generated about a 65-page memo laying out various antitrust theories from bid rigging, 2C Robinson Patman Act, market allocation, mm -hmm that might be used to address various types of public corruption. <clears throat> it wasn't until 73 when I came back to work full time that I found out that those hypothetical cases he had given me were from the trial transcript of what was known as the Hudson 8 trial, which was a US United States attorney's indictment of the John V. Kinney political organization in Hudson County, New Jersey, for kickbacks and extortion over a 20-year period. Yeah, that never occurred in Connecticut, <clears throat> I guess. Well, probably not with the degree of organization. <laughs> I, I remember when we were talking to Herb Stern in the early part of the investigation, somebody had asked him how they identified people who were paying kickbacks. And he said, well, when we went in with the search warrant and seized the payment records, we got the payments register journal, and we noticed <clears throat> in the margin there were little check marks by certain checks. And when we asked the uh, city clerk's office why there were check marks by those entries, they said, oh, those were the checks that we gave to Mr. Murphy, the purchasing agent, because he couldn't deliver them till he'd gotten his collections. <laughs> <laughs> So you think you could have figured out that that was a problem? Uh, we decided, yeah, that, that was a problem. And one of the advantages that we had early on is Bernard Murphy had been one of the principal defendants in the Hudson 8 trial. He had been sentenced to 15 years in federal prison. And the day we first interviewed him was the end of his second week in the Manhattan House of Detention. <laughs> and he was on a 15-year sentence, wouldn't be parole eligible for seven and a half years, and he decided if he cooperated with us in the civil case to recoup the kickbacks, <laughs> maybe he could get his sentence <laughs> status changed. And did which, he? Which, yeah, and he did. He? did. He, did. Uh, he ultimately got out. The worst thing for the case was once he got out of prison, he really wasn't that interested in talking to us that much anymore. <laughs> but fortunately, we had all of his testimony memorialized. What, what about the laundry chemicals case? Well, the laundry chemicals case was actually a, a strange case. And I have to give you a little history of laundry chemicals. Industrial laundry chemicals 
are more caustic and require different handling than the stuff you and I would buy and use at home. And basically, commercial machines have injector pumps that modulate and inject precise amounts into the wash and rinse cycles at appropriate times. And to change from one contract to another, that there's a fixed cost of changing all the injectors because those are proprietary to each manufacturer. And the state had had one contractor for a number of years. It went out to bid and they lost. Well, the transition was a fairly extended period of months to transition from one contract to another. And one of this company's employees had recently gone to work for the state prison system in what was known as the Bureau of State Use Industries. And State Use Industries had a statute that required every public entity in New Jersey to buy products manufactured by state New Use Industries regardless of whether they had any other public contract for it. And an arrangement was entered into with this former employee who was now a public official that the contractor would supply, quote, private label laundry chemicals to state use industries, which they would then sell at a slightly higher price to the subdivisions of New Jersey. And we got a complaint from the winning bidder saying that they're basically stealing this contract from us. And we ultimately indicted uh, both the company and the public official for uh, essentially a Section 1 Sherman Act mm -hmm. claim. And, and what, what uh, type of remedy was there? Well, the, problem, the individuals go to, to the slammer? Well, th the problem was that the defendant filed a motion to dismiss on the grounds that we'd improperly charged the Section 2 offense under Section 1. And I hadn't been involved in the case at all up to that point because I was involved in a case somewhere out of state. And I get this call, you know, come back, you got to argue this motion. So I go in, I spend an hour and a half convincing the judge that the indictment's proper. Uh, it's a convoluted argument to get from what is essentially unitary conduct to a Section 1. But at the end of the argument, she looked at me, and she had had an office next door to me some years before that, when we were both in the AG's office, and she said, I've known you, Mr. Price, for many years. I trust your judgment in virtually all matters. You have persuaded me that this indictment is proper as written. Said, you've also persuaded me that the grand jury, who was only read the statute, could not have conceivably understood the legal consequences <laughs> that you've explained to me, and she dismissed the indictment without prejudice. Nice job, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> so I then went back, and, and the company itself basically came in and said, all you're going to get from us is money. We'll pay you anything you want, sign a consent decree. We'll help you in the prosecution of the public official. And so ultimately, we, when we re-indicted it, we simply indicted him for official misconduct. Did he end up going to jail? I don't remember. Oh. It, it really it wasn't my case, and I didn't handle the sentencing. Uh, I suspect that since there was never any proof that he got money as such, that he probably got a probationary sentence. Yeah. Uh, there's one other matter, and then I wanted to ask you about the sort of the criminal civil... Uh, relationship because it was very different in New Jersey than it was in states <laughs> like mine in Connecticut. Uh, but the, uh, the the Minter case, State v. Minter, and this would have been mid to late eighties, I'm thinking, more or less. Uh, basically, it, the case walked in the door. A guy came in and said, "There's going to be a bid opening day after tomorrow." for a low-income weatherization contract to put custom storm windows on a house. He said, I went by the job site this morning, and there are custom windows have already been delivered to the job site 
in the name of one of the people who have been doing many of these contracts. And he basically said there's a three to six week lead time to order custom manufactured windows. <laughs> and he was suspicious that this guy could have known in advance he was going to win the bid, would invest the money, have the stuff delivered to the job site. That's unbelievable. And when we interviewed the guy a little further, he then also told us that he had tried to get qualified to get on the bidder's list and nothing had been sent, said to him directly by the contract administrator, but he was convinced he was being solicited to pay a bribe. So we approached it as if it were going to be a corruption investigation from day one, and we didn't issue any subpoenas immediately. Uh, I sent my investigators out to essentially follow the guys who had been winning the bids and just get a picture of you know what their daily activity was and they all seemed to congregate in one or two local neighborhood bars in the Trenton area and so they then went and talked to some of the street cops working that area and they put us in touch with a street informant who basically told us that they were paying bribes to Mr. Minter who was the contract administrator and that Mr. Minter had a history of involvement in drugs and that the informant had recorded a conversation between himself and Minter for the DEA trying to buy cocaine and he'd placed the call to Mr. Minter's office telephone. And because the transaction never went down, DEA had no intention of doing anything with it. Well, I was getting <clears throat> a lot of pressure at this time from senior administration officials in the department where Minter worked. They wanted us to arrest him because they didn't have grounds to fire him. And I wasn't ready to arrest him on bid rigging or corruption grounds because we hadn't even served subpoenas yet. So we went to the DEA and asked them if they'd give us the tape. And so we got Minter out of office by arresting him and ultimately indicting and convicting him for conspiracy to distribute cocaine. What, what percentage, I you think, of your time in the, in the AG's office uh, was really devoted to criminal as opposed to <clears throat> civil enforcement? Uh, probably 25 to 30 percent, and that number is high in terms of indictments and convictions. There's a lot of time spent investigating matters that yep. were potentially criminal that just never panned out. And, and you had a, I was thinking about this, you had a somewhat different relationship with the Antitrust Division Department of Justice because of your criminal enforcement responsibilities in contrast <laughs> to a state like, like Connecticut where we had no criminal powers. Yeah, we were actually competitors. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember when Ann Bingaman came in as Assistant Attorney General, one of her first 60 minute presentations, she announced that when the division found matters of local criminal interest and impact, that they were going to refer those to states that had criminal authority. Uh, as far as I know, nobody ever got one of those referrals, but that was you know, kind of the, the competitive relationship we have. I never actually worked a case with the division. I know we actually did work a case with the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We were investigating bid rigging on school buses in central New Jersey, and we bumped into the U.S. Attorney's Office who was doing a Hobbs Act investigation because they thought the contract administrator was being bribed. And we ultimately divided the market, if you will. They took the corruption case. We took the bid rigging virtually all of the testimony was presented in the state grand jury. Uh, we had cross-designated an AUSA, mm -hmm. assistant U.S. attorney, as a special deputy attorney general, and then they simply took the transcripts from our grand jury, presented them to a federal grand jury, and basically returned indictments pretty much on the same day. Yeah, in our state, as you know, we, our allocation was different. We would look at a particular matter and, and the antitrust <clears throat> division would take the criminal case.
and and we would take a civil case, usually in a different geographic area. But it, but you, your your situation, I think, was truly unique because I'm not sure there are many other states that spend such a significant portion of the resources on on criminal antitrust enforcement. Yeah, the only other one that I really recall is when Mike Zaleski was in Wisconsin, Wisconsin in the right. late 70s and early 80s. He tried to do primarily criminal. Right, unless he was a former criminal prosecutor. Yeah, he, he had done, I think it was the University of Wisconsin bombing prosecutions. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, you and I may be the only two people who actually remember that until, <laughs> until this interview. Um, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the origins of, of the uh, NAG Multi-State Antitrust Task Force. There were predecessor organizations, two of them, uh, the Eastern States Antitrust Committee uh, and, and ESALC. Uh, Which was the Eastern States Action Litigation Committee, yeah. which actually predated ESAC. Right. Uh, ESALC came into being in the late 70s initially to develop a unified position regarding postal rate increases. And over time, those meetings became more and more related to antitrust. And at some point, the first assistant who had been attending those meetings took me to one. And at the end of the meeting where we had discussed virtually nothing but antitrust, he told me that from now on, I was going. And Steve Greenfogel and I sat down uh, about two or three days later. And Steve was the head in, 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 in Massachusetts, Massachusetts while right. I was at <clears throat> Connecticut and right. you in New Jersey. And, right. and basically said, you know, there are a whole bunch of people coming to this ESOC thing who know nothing about antitrust. Why don't we just leave them to whatever they're going to do and rename it ESAC and invite the rest of the northeastern states? And we started doing regional litigation. Uh, I think it was copper water right. tubing. I remember the one we started <clears throat> with was, was uh, copper water tubing. And, right. And, and basically, there was a federal class action filed on behalf of a number of states right. in the Eastern District of New York. And then there were four or five cases filed in different state courts. And we did it on a coordinated basis. I think we drove the defendants crazy because we did file <clears throat> actions in each of these state courts, which they could not remove to federal court, and that made them very upset, I think. It, it did, and it also got me in trouble with the Chief Justice of New Jersey in State v. Lawn King because I hadn't learned the lesson yet in oral argument, especially in Supreme Courts, that sometimes you don't answer rhetorical questions. And we had been having a debate about the, the benefits and burdens of federalism and what costs it imposed on business if New Jersey, for instance, were to adopt an antitrust rule different from other states. And the Chief Justice, wanting to move on and sort of dismiss me, said, well, Mr. Price, you obviously don't run an interstate business. I said, quite right. But I'm involved in this case where I've got cases in four state courts and a federal court, and we got you know five different kinds of rules for litigation, and it requires a bit of agility and cost to coordinate this, but we do it quite nicely. And I was told two days later by an associate justice that I knew very well that I had annoyed the chief to no end. And, and what was the result of, of his annoyance? Uh, well, the result. Or, what, or was there a consequence to his annoyance? I guess it would be a better way to ask the question. Well, let's put it this way: State v. Lawn King is probably the only criminal tying case in the history of the antitrust <laughs> laws. Uh, I think that's correct. It, it, it had other problems. I mean, basically, it was a franchise lawn service, right. and you had a fixed price which violated Dr. Miles. You had. Uh, exclusive territories, which violated uh, Schwinn, Schwinn, at, Schwinn, at Schwinn at the time, between 67. What year was, was, was Lawn King? Well, Lawn King was indicted in about 76, but it doesn't get to trial for a long time because lawyers kept telling him to plead guilty, and he kept firing them. <laughs> so we were a long time getting it to trial. And then there were some tying cases under the theory that they were ancillary to the price-fixing in territories. And after he was convicted at a bench trial, but before sentencing, GTE Sylvania comes down. Schwinn goes, bye-bye. 
and there's a motion to set aside the verdict, and the trial judge says no because the price fixing was supported by evidence of actual coercion. Mm -hmm. And it goes up to the appellate division. The appellate division reverses because of a mistake made by the lawyer who tried the case. And it's a mistake that wouldn't have mattered in a jury trial, but does in a bench trial. And that is the evidence of coercion was all based on nonverbal conduct of the witness. The, the question was, why did you charge this price? And the answer was gripping the arms of the chair, pounding on the arm of the chair and saying, Joe Sandler told me to. Well, when you read it in the transcript, when I ultimately inherited the appeal because the trial lawyer died from complications of a kidney transplant, I'm going through and there's this provision that says the, 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 the price was coerced and it gives me a transcript reference and I thumb through the transcript and I read, why did you charge this price? Joe told me to. And the appellate division entered a judgment of acquittal rather yep. than just reversing. So it gets to the Supreme Court and was arguably moot, but no one in the case realized the double jeopardy problem until it dawned on me the day before oral argument. Uh, so ultimately, the, the judge's revenge was affirmed. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you just tell us a bit about the, the impact of the uh, the federal grant money uh, in, in the uh, which I think came out of an LA, LEAA uh, grant uh, given to the states to enhance antitrust enforcement in the 70s? Yeah, this is and there are a couple of things happening all around the same time. 19, late 1975 the Congress passes the Consumer Goods Pricing Act of 1975 repealing the fair trade laws. Uh, you have the LEA law enforcement grants to be administered by the Department of Justice mm -hmm. and you have the Hart Scott Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act of 1976 which gives the states parents patriae powers. And one of the things in the grants in addition to the money going to each state is there was a, another appropriation to NAG to fund training operation and I was chair of the NAG training committee which was actually a subcommittee of the antitrust committee mm -hmm. from 78 to 81 and we were doing annual seminars one feature of which became the roundtable which became the clearinghouse function, sort of, of the task of the force. Task force right. But a number of states that had no antitrust law or had an antitrust law and weren't doing anything, all of a sudden had money and had programs. Because one of the realities of law enforcement in the 1970s is whatever you could get a grant for was what the priority was today. And there had been a long history of LEAA money driving law enforcement policy in state AG's offices and in local prosecutors' offices. So did, did you end up hiring a bunch of folks with the money? Uh, well, we had about seven or eight lawyers and eight or nine investigators at the time. By the end of the grant period, we had somewhere 13 to 14 lawyers and more than 20 investigators. And Which I think may have been the largest department in the United States at that point. It's certainly larger than New York at that point. Well, when you counted the investigators, investigators. because most people didn't have dedicated criminal investigators, okay. and we put most of that money into a single investigation of the organized crime influence in the solid waste industry, so we also had a squad of criminal investigators from the state police detailed to the operation as well. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, both DOJ and FTC uh, promoting state antitrust enforcement around that time, uh, I'm going to talk about that before we get to um, the, the Baxter-Miller years, which, which then preceded your tenure as chair of the Yeah, Texas. and the Baxter-Miller years and what preceded it is really important for the following reason. Beginning in the early 70s, 
both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission made a concerted effort through NAG, through some LEAA money that NAG had for training before the 1978 grant. Uh, and they were actively soliciting states to become active in enforcement because they perceived there was a lot of local impact work that they simply weren't getting to. And so there was a very active program, you know, state AGs, come do this work with us. And then the Reagan administration comes in, uh, Bill Baxter and Jim Miller basically want to slam their door on the fingers of the state AGs and or that other, caused or other, or a lot other of, parts perhaps <laughs> yes. and, and that caused a lot of anger right. uh, and we perceived as states that they were creating an enforcement vacuum right. that they ultimately intended to dismantle the law and that we the states would become the filler for that vacuum indeed I was on a program with Bill Baxter after he had gone back to Stanford and it was basically I, Bill, and Sandy Litvak, who had been Bill's predecessor who had indicted Cuisinarts for RPM, resale price maintenance. And Bill got up and did his general, you can't trust the states because they're all politically motivated. And Sandy got up and essentially said, you got nobody to blame but yourself, Bill. You created the vacuum they moved to fill. Absolutely right. A and then my response was, well, if the choice is pandering to voters who are consumers or pandering to contributors, I guess I'll pander to voters. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to make sure we get to this before uh, uh, the interview is over. So uh, can we move forward to um, the, insurance, mm -hmm. the insurance litigation uh, that you played such a central role mm -hmm. in? Um, and, and talk briefly about the nature of the case and then uh, the importance of the argument that you made in both uh, the Ninth Circuit and the United States Supreme Court. Well, I'm going to start by reminding you of something you said in your interview in this same project a couple of years ago. And the insurance case is a case that had the potential for having driven a stake through the heart of the whole coordinated NAG effort that was the task force because at an early NAG meeting and this was probably 86 or 87 and I believe it was in Austin, Texas, we were told that New York, Minnesota, Texas, California and one other state were doing an investigation to find out whether there was an antitrust problem with the insurance industry refusing to offer occurrence-based liability coverage to governmental entities. Uh, the states had attempted to shop the case to the antitrust division, and I believe it was Chuck Rule wrote a letter basically saying there are so many actors in liability insurance that it's implausible that a conspiracy could exist. Uh, so th an investigation was undertaken and everyone had an expectation that at the end of the investigation a report would be made to NAG and if there was a litigation opportunity people would be given an opportunity to get up to speed and sign on. What ultimately happened is early 1988 the litigation was filed by I believe it was then eight states. Right with Texas filing in state court, bring this litigation claiming this international conspiracy among four primary insurance carriers in the United States and a large group of international reinsurers to eliminate claims made coverage in the Current, United States. Occurrence based, yeah. Or occurrence based occurrence coverage. Occurrence based and switch it to claims made, right? Yes. And all of the states who weren't part of that were utterly blindsided. I know your office in particular, the home of the insurance industry, there was an editorial cartoon vilifying Joe Lieberman for being in bed with the Hartford stag. And there was just... A form of animal husbandry, <laughs> actually. Uh, not practiced at most state schools. <laughs> uh, and 
there was a meeting, I guess, about two weeks later in Chicago uh, of all the states who were interested in insurance who weren't included in the first wave. And I have never seen such manifest anger at other state AGs in, in right. my life. That was... And basically, there was a second wave filing, and Mike Brockmeyer and I... Mike, pretty, Mike was... Uh, about to become the task force, force chair. chair. And he's from Maryland, right. From Maryland. He and I basically went to an all-states meeting after the filings had been made by the second wave and took control of the litigation, uh, put in a steering committee that was dominated largely by the second wave filers, but with key personnel from the first wave to, to try to get it back into some sort of coordinated management. And ultimately, it was successful from a management standpoint, but there was still a lot of uh, conflict over the theory of the case. Uh, we lost on a summary judgment motion in the district court, and we restructured the argument going into the Ninth Circuit. Which you did. Uh, I and Lisa Teagle from Minnesota were the principal authors of this brief based on suggestions made by Herb Hovenkamp and Bob Land. Uh, who were outside consultants that we had retained, and basically changed it from a boycott of a type of coverage to a conspiracy to deprive competitors of the reinsurance input to offer the coverage. Right. And that's the theory we ultimately prevailed on. Yeah, and you um, uh, argued the case in the U.S. Supreme Court, and... and uh to rave reviews is, is certainly the, the best advocate we'd ever had in the Supreme Court on an on antitrust case. So we're all, uh, as assistant AGs, we're, we're uh, beholden to you for uh, upholding <laughs> or, or enhancing our tradition at that point. Um, before, again, before we run out of time, I want to make sure we cover the time that, as you had succeeded me as task force chair from 92 to 95, mm. uh, and there were certain key issues that occurred during your tenure as, as chair of the NAG task force, I, I want to make sure that you get a chance to cover, including uh, you know, revisions to the guidelines uh, and the Illinois BRIC task force. Yeah, basically while I was chair, uh, we revised both the merger guidelines, the vertical guidelines, and the voluntary information disclosure compact. And the modifications had sort of a central theme to them. And the two central themes were, one, we were now in a cooperative relationship with the federal agencies. So the rhetoric which had infused the earlier editions of both the merger guidelines and the vertical restraints guidelines needed to be ratcheted down several levels. And then there had been intervening case law that needed to be accommodated. And for the first time, for instance, we put in a provision in the vertical restraints guidelines with a market power filter, which we had assiduously uh, resisted in, in the first version. And you know, the, the, those were probably the biggest things that were done during my tenure in, in terms of guidelines. Now, the Illinois BRIC Task Force was actually an ABA antitrust section exercise. Right. Uh, you and I and... Tom Rush. Tom Rush and... Rich Wallace. And Rich Wallace and Kai Ewing mm -hmm. were tasked to see if we could come up with a legislative proposal to remedy the Illinois BRIC problem, the indirect purchaser problem, which would be acceptable to both state attorneys general and the business community. And we basically came up with a draft statute that had a presumption that the injury was vested in the end user of the price fixed goods as long as the goods were in substantially the form that existed at the time of the price yeah, fixing. And even though I was nominally the chair of the task force, you actually came up with the idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was actually my draft. And the sticking point, at least from the state side, 
is we all agreed that it would only work if it preempted contrary state statutes. The and big P word. Right. Yes, the, the P word. But since it had a presumption that was consistent with all the state statutes, we hoped it would be acceptable. And what happened? Ultimately, the, the, the states refused to even consider the use of the P word, and the business roundtable kind of looked at it in a short-sighted sense and said, well, gee, these state repealers haven't been used much. We don't think there's enough reason to modify this, which may have been short-sighted because in a few years when state council, or not state council, when private council discovered the ability to go into state court with class actions using the state indirect purchaser statute, the, there was a whole spate of indirect purchaser mm -hmm litigation that could have been avoided. Now, I, I think you and I have talked about this many times, that there was a limited time frame in which the problem could have been resolved. The fact that we were both task force chairs, state enforcers, and Mike Brockmeyer all supported, right. Mike was the other, was supported this, um, the time has now passed. Uh, but I wanted, before we end, to make sure that you get a chance to talk at least briefly about, as you referred to, the once-in-a-lifetime case, State v. Laid Law. <laughs> Every criminal prosecutor has dreams about cases like State v. Laidlaw. Uh, August of 1996, I just got back from a vacation fishing in Canada. I'd been in the office a couple of days, and I get a call from my boss. It says, call the Monmouth County prosecutor. Now, normally, when you get a call from a prosecutor's office, it's one of the assistant prosecutors. But this was called the prosecutor himself. So I called him and he said, I've got this guy sitting in my office. And this is like 8.30 in the morning. And he says he has a sheet of paper that has what he claims will be the winning and losing bids on handicapped children bus routes for over 100 routes that are supposed <laughs> to be, uh, the bid opening is supposed to be at 11 o'clock this morning. He, he claims he was at a bid rigging meeting and this is the result of how the bids were allocated and what everyone was supposed to bid. What should I tell him to do? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, tell him to go submit whatever bids he's supposed to bid. And uh, we talked a little bit and, and I said, you know, has he said anything to the agency? And he said, well, he went to the agency last night and told the purchasing director that he had this piece of paper. And she refused to take it on the grounds that it was hearsay. So immediately bells are going off in my head, you know, is there a corrupt relationship between mm -hmm. the agency and the bidder? And so I asked the prosecutor if he knew who the outside legal counsel to the agency was. And we talked about that, and he told me he was... You know, an extremely ethical lawyer, and that if the, anything bad was going on in the agency, he would look out for the agency and not the employees. So I said, okay, tell him to go bid, tell him to be back in your office first thing tomorrow morning. I then got counsel for the agency and said, look, here's what I've been told. I have these suspicions. I want you with your client and all the bid records in the prosecutor's office tomorrow morning. And I said, I want you to threaten your client within an inch of their life that if one iota of this gets out, I'm going to come down on them like you don't want to know. And so we go in the next morning, and the bids are 99% identical to his list. Unbelievable. So I tell the agency, okay. I want you to reject the bids on the grounds that the state refused to pr approve the specification and announce a rebid in 30 days. And so we did that, and we wired up our informant with a video recording device in his office and sat and recorded for 30 days conversations between he and the other bidders that everything That's was going to stay on track for the rebid. That's unbelievable. And so the day of the rebid opening, uh, we had gone in the night before to the assignment judge in Monmouth County. He had signed search warrants for the businesses, the persons, and the vehicles of the companies and their principal officers. 
we had entered an order to show cause that will be served the next day on why their businesses should not have monitor trustees imposed to uh, mm -hmm. observe and validate the independence of their bidding on any subsequent rebids because we had been told by the agency if we invalidated the companies as bidders there was no one to handle the transportation of handicapped kids in the two county area. Unbelievable. And what you said this was late late 90s? This would yeah. have been 96. So yeah. the next morning at the bid opening we arrested the bidders at the bid opening on the without a warrant on the grounds that they were committing the offense in the presence of the officer and served and executed the search warrants. Well, Laurel, I just I want to thank you for sharing your observations with us. Uh, you and I have been friends for let's see, it's, it's almost forty years now, almost. and, and uh, uh, it's been an honor to to be your friend and and to to learn a bit about things that I I never did because I was never a criminal prosecutor. So. Thank you very much on behalf of the ABA Section Antitrust Law. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome.